Welcome to another episode of the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today is another one of our special episodes all about Palestine. We're recording this on Friday, November 24th at 5 p.m. in uh, Palestine time. Our special guest today is Maha Nassar, who is a associate professor of at the University of Arizona and the author of Brothers Apart, Palestinian Citizens of Israel and the Arab World. Maha, welcome to Afikra. Thank you, Mikey. It's good to be here. You know, I reached out to you because I came across your book and was super interested in what life is like for Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, who have Israeli uh, passports, um, often termed uh, 48 uh, Palestinian, 48 Palestinians. Um, before we get into the broader conversation, I'd love to be, uh, I'd love for you to answer or tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write that book in particular. That's a great question. So I am myself a Palestinian American. I'm the daughter of Palestinian refugees from 1948. So the daughter of Nakba survivors. Um, and I grew up in the Chicago area, which has a very large Palestinian community there. The Most of that community comes from the West Bank. And my own experience was with Palestinians in exile, whether in the Arab world or in the U.S. And so I was always very interested in Palestinian history, culture, society. Um, and I was also really interested in sort of growing up thinking about how my own experiences as a Palestinian American didn't match with what was being presented in American media, or it didn't match what was, you know, the general understanding of who the Palestinians are and what they wanted in the broader American context. So when I got to graduate school, uh, I knew I was interested in Palestinian history and culture and society, but I wasn't sure exactly what, frankly, uh, I wanted to focus on there is a lot of uh, you know a lot of work being done on mandate period earlier or later or so forth. Um, I was actually in the NALC program, the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations program at the University of Chicago. That's where I got my PhD. And as part of that, we have to learn several Near Eastern languages. And so Hebrew was my second additional Middle Eastern language, um, or one of them in addition to Arabic, which I already had. And so uh, I had to, as part of uh, one of my assignments, translate Anton Shammas's 1988 essay, uh, The Morning After. Uh, Anton Shammas is a Palestinian 48er, Palestinian citizen of Israel, and a novelist. And he was writing during the first intifada what would happen to him and his people the morning after a Palestinian state was created in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. This is coming on the heels of sort of all the two-state talk of that time. And as I was translating, kind of struggling to translate his essay from Hebrew into English, I realized that a lot of the sentiments that he was expressing were ones that I could deeply relate to as a Palestinian living as a minority in settler colonial lands, um, but also in some ways was very fascinating to me because I was so unfamiliar with the specific experiences of Palestinians in 1948 Palestine in the Green Line. And so that set me on that course, and I um, sort of haven't, haven't looked back. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's um, a, population, a, a, a population of the broader, um, you know, Palestinian um, community globally that is so often overlooked and misunderstood, deeply, yeah. deeply misunderstood what their, what their daily life is. Um, mm -hmm. do you have a sense of, um, what daily life for Palestinians living in, uh, inside of, you know, inside of the state of Israel right now, what their daily lives are like, um, and the amount of sort of uh, targeting that they are receiving? Uh, it's, it's bad. I mean, it's, uh, the, the folks I've talked to who are living where Palestinians living inside the green line, um, talk about really never having felt so, um, in such danger 
before. So historically, what my book talks about are the daily indignities and state repression and daily uh, racism that Palestinians have faced really since the very beginning. They were placed under a military government, even though technically they were citizens of Israel, and they faced checkpoints and arbitrary arrests and all kinds of discrimination and indignation. I think now, though, the level of violence and the level of genocidal rhetoric coming out of Israel is unprecedented. So again, back when I was writing my book, the dominant discourse was, at least the dominant public discourse that Jewish Israelis had, that the Israeli government had, was these are a content minority living in a democratic state, and they're fine, and they're happy, and don't ask too many questions. And unfortunately, many Arabs in, in Arab states sort of uh, accepted that propaganda and then saw the Palestinians as having assimilated into the Israeli state, which was not true. But now you have in Israel, Israeli Knesset members and government leaders who speak very openly and very brazenly about these Palestinians as a fifth column, as a threat to the state, as you know, terrorist sympathizers or Hamas sympathizers. And so what's happened is that the little bits of public space that has opened up in recent decades that allows for some Palestinian dissent inside the Green Line is being shut very rapidly, it has been shut rapidly. So again, to sort of compare and contrast, when I was writing, you know, the, the time period that I cover in my book, which is the 1950s, there were very few Palestinian demonstrations that were allowed to happen. And they happened typically under the auspices of the Communist Party, which was a joint Arab Jewish party. And so that gave sort of some cover. Over the course of the 70s, 80s, 90s, more political space opened up for Palestinians to be able to protest as Palestinians in Israel. And that trend continued into the 2000s and the 2010s, culminating in many ways in the 2021 um, Dignity Intifada that we, that we all saw in, in May of 2021. And so now what we're seeing is a huge um, regression back to those much earlier days when there was a great deal more violence and a great deal more repression, except now that it's also being accompanied by genocidal language, which is something that we didn't see early on. Yeah. You know, it's funny because when people talk about um, the the collapse of the two-state solution as a possibility and and reaffirming this idea of, and no, khalas, it's, um, we need to to move into a, a one-state solution. Wendy Perlman, who was on the series a, a few weeks ago, said, you know, political scientists often say that there is no one-state solution, but there's a one-state reality. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to move towards a one-state solution. For people who are unfamiliar with this, the reality on the ground, I think they'd be surprised by um, uh, the daily struggles and the amount of discrimination and uh, Jim Crow era, um, the Jim Crow level uh, discrimination, uh, discrimination and systemic racism, there still exists. And, you know, these are not equal citizens under the, um, in the eyes of the law. No, not at all. Not at all. So the discrimination happens on many, many levels. So if we're going to think about it in comparison, say, to Jim Crow, we can think about it first in terms of segregation. So Palestinians, uh, in 1948, those who ended up not becoming refugees and ultimately ended up staying in their lands, they may have stayed in their country, but they didn't necessarily stay in their, in their actual homes. And so, especially in a lot of mixed cities, Palestinians were shoved into ghettos, essentially, that were uh, cordoned off, patrolled, and they weren't allowed to leave. They weren't allowed to live or move elsewhere. So in Haifa, for example, 
which is often held up as the sort of the paragon of the mixed Arab Jewish city in Israel. Palestinians were shunted into a tiny corner of Haifa called Wadi Nisnaz. And if you go look, if you go and visit there, it looks like an urban ghetto. There are very few municipal resources, overcrowding, underfunding, poor schools, I mean, you name it. And then when Palestinians try to move into, say, the nicer parts of Haifa, they face, sometimes they face co-op boards that say, well, you're not a good fit for our neighborhood or for our apartment building. They'll find uh, people not willing to rent to the landlords, not willing to rent to them. Um, All kinds of things that sort of are both subtle and not so subtle, depending on um, sort of who you ask and who is experiencing those things. We can talk about employment discrimination as well. Uh, We can talk about the fact that Palestinians, even at the college level, are often not admitted into certain majors that are deemed to be highly, um, uh, that have security, that require security clearances. And so then they don't go into the high-tech industries or the, um, you know, the intelligence industries in the same ways that other, that Jewish Israelis are able to enter into the so-called startup technologies and industries. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the list goes on and on. You know, um, when I spoke to a few, uh, I think uh, about a week ago, and we were talking about this interview, you had just published this piece, um, or recently published this piece about the history of the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Um, mm-hmm. so maybe if you will, can you give us a little history about where that phrase comes from? Sure. So I think first it's helpful to think about that concept behind the phrase. So the idea, the, the phrase itself from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And it's rooted, I think it is, has become so popular among Palestinians because it's 10 short words. And in those 10 words, Palestinians are able to articulate their attachment to their land, the assertion of their national claims, and uh, visions of liberation and peace for the future. And so in terms of attachment to land or personal ties to land, I mean, Mikey, this is something you know as well as I do. When two Palestinians meet each other anywhere in the world or two Lebanese meet each other anywhere in the world, one of the first things they'll ask themselves is, oh, you're Palestinian? Palestinian? What Baland are you from? Where in Palestine are you from? Right? And Lebanese do the same, Syrians do the same. That's very very much a part of our social and cultural um, heritage and um, custom for, in, among folks from our parts of our part of the world. And so from the river to the sea is saying that Palestinians are from all parts of Palestine, from, you know, Jericho and Safa near the Jordan River, all the way to Haifa and Yafna on the Mediterranean coast. And that attempts to deny those connections, whether it's by saying, You know, a two-state solution means Palestinians have to forget any attachments to lands inside Israel, or whether it's to say Palestinians don't have any national claims or personal ties because they're just Arabs. That was an old Orientalist trope that we still hear today, right? There's no such thing as Palestinians. They're just Arabs. They should go to Iraq or Lebanon or whatever. So from the river to the sea is first and foremost, I think, an assertion of those real family, personal, ancestral ties, not just to an abstract place or a national designation called Palestine, but to actual specific towns and villages within Palestine. And those attachments predate Palestinian national national identity or movement, right? These go way back before the 20th century. So that's, I think, really important. The second part of that about Palestine being free ties into the colonial legacy of Palestine and the fact that so many colonial schemes have been presented to try to partition Palestine and again deny Palestinians their ties to their ancestral lands. We know most famously about the 1947 partition plan, which divided Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. 
The catch with that plan is that if it were implemented, it would have meant that half a million Palestinians living in what had been slated to be part of the Jewish state would have had to make a cruel choice to either live as a minority in their own lands or to leave. And we know that by 1947, tens of thousands of Palestinians had already been forced off their lands. And so they knew that accepting partition would be acquiescing to their own destruction. And so those two phrases, those two halves of that phrase really um, indicate and affirm Palestinians' personal ties to their land and the fact that they're not free right now to live in their ancestral because they've been kicked out, because they're under occupation, because they're living as second-class citizens in Israel. So that's the overall kind of yeah. um, idea behind it. The more specific kind of roots of the phrase go back to the late 60s. Uh, among the PLO and other Palestinians, mainly Palestinians in exile, who again were seeking to affirm this phrase. You know, that by, nine, by the late 60s, Palestinian refugees had been in exile for 20 years by that point. Is this post, post 67? This is shortly after 67. Um, I haven't traced like the exact year when it sort of emerges, but by the late 60s, we start to see this phrase come into circulation in demonstrations, in, you know, in kind of sentiments that people are expressing. And it builds over the course of the 1970s. And I think it builds in part because we start to see the PLO leadership starting in the mid-70s inch away from the idea of the full liberation of Palestine and inch towards the idea of a truncated Palestinian state um, just in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And so... For Palestinian refugees, most of whom are not from the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the idea of giving up on their national claims and personal ties to their homeland from the river to the sea was a very worrying one. Um, and so we start to see that be a kind of articulation initially of Palestinians in exile. But then, as I found as I was doing research for this article, even Palestinians under occupation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, those who you would think would be the most amenable to the idea of a two-state solution, during the first Intifada in the late 80s and early 90s, were also saying this chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And so I think it speaks to this broader idea of a refusal of fragmentation of the people and their refusal of the partition of the land. So it's saying the Palestinian people are one and the Palestinian and that Palestine as a land is one. Yeah. I understand the I understand the power um, and the the significance. I'm curious if you've given any thought to the the potency of it. Um and why there are people who are literally calling for these 10 words to be banned. Um, in certain places in Europe and obviously in, in, in Israel. Um, why do yeah. you think they're, why is it so potent of an idea? I think part of its potency is its simplicity and its universality. So yeah. I think it's important to know that this phrase is, is, uh, is um, this phrase is articulating a principle and not a platform. Right? Freedom for Palestinians or freedom for Palestine from the river to the sea could take lots of different shapes. It could be a two-state solution. It could be a one-state solution. It could be a confederation, a binational state, uh, you know, single democratic secular state for all. Freedom can be manifested in, in lots of different ways, but the principle there is really powerful and is universal and is one that speaks to a much longer legacy of Palestinian political calls. So to go back to the potency of it for a minute, and then I'll, I'll turn to the, the banning of it, or the attempted ban. But in terms of the potency, the idea of a free Palestine itself goes back even before 1948. So 1946, for example, we see proposals 
being put forth by Palestinians and Arabs to the international community, saying instead of partition, which is what the Zionists and the British and the UN were, were talking about, rather than partition, we're proposing a unitary state that would have a democratic constitution. And the proposal put forth in 1946 uh, guaranteed freedom of religious practice. And I think importantly, in its text said that it would recognize the right of Jews to, quote, employ the Hebrew language as a second official language. And so the pushback against partition was in, in an attempt to say, we need to live together, that sharing the land rather than segregation is the path forward. And we see this again re-articulated in the 1960s. Fertak said that it wanted its goal to be a democratic state capable of holding Jews, Muslims, and Christians alike. This is in 1969. And they went on to say that all citizens would, quote, have equal rights and obligations irrespective of race, color, or creed, unquote. And so the, the, the potency of this phrase is that at its root, it's a call, a principle of freedom of democracy, of equality, and of anti-racism. And so the threat in all of that is that it then draws attention to its opposite, which is segregation, oppression, occupation, expulsion, racism, settler colonialism, and the fundamental denial of rights and equality. And that's threatening to the status quo. And so that's part of where I think the pushback is coming through. Part of the pushback is coming from the idea that this isn't just a tweet. This phrase isn't just calling for a tweak here or there, you know, change things on the margins that one way or another. It's calling for a radical rethinking of a century of Western approaches to how we solve this problem that is, you know, the question of Palestine or Palestinian Israeli conflict, however you want to phrase it. The dominant framework has been partition, segregation, separation. And Palestinians are saying no. The solution is freedom, equality in a unified land. So that's part of it. The other part of it, so what I'll say is that's that's a more perhaps generous reading, right? That people yeah. in the West and in in European countries and so forth, they don't understand, they don't see it's too big of a shift and so forth. But there's a, uh, uh, a, a perhaps mm, deeper source of that opposition and one that's perhaps less rosy. And that is that I also see the pushback and the, specifically the attempts to ban this phrase as part of a much longer legacy of attempts to erase the Palestinian people and delegitimize their national claims. So what do I mean by that? Well, we know that settler colonial projects in general always try to eliminate the native inhabitants, whether through genocide, through ethnic cleansing, or, and perhaps I should say and, by denying and erasing indigenous connections to their land. I'm talking to you today from Southern Arizona, where the Thorna Otham Nation was nearly annihilated in the 19th century. And the descendants of those survivors live on a reservation, on a tiny part of what was their ancestral homework. And so those attempts at elimination of the natives are often accompanied by racist depictions of the indigenous population as being transient, as being without real roots, as being barbaric. And that settler colonial logic holds that because those natives are transient, they can just be moved somewhere else. And if they resist being moved to somewhere else, well, then that's because they're inherently violent, they're full of hate, they are barbaric, and the settler has no choice but to kill them. And whoever doesn't get killed is contained, segregated, or cordoned off. So in the case of Zionist settler colonialism, they didn't annihilate the Palestinian people. 
They did undertake an ethnic cleansing in 1948. But I think even more important, or as importantly, I'll say, as importantly as the ethnic cleansing, they also denied and continue to deny, many of them continue to deny that Palestinians have any legitimate ties to their land. Mm. And that narrative took hold in the, in the United States and in many parts of the West, uh, Western Europe, in the West, um, as far back as the 1950s. I wrote another article that was published uh, earlier this year in Critical Sociology, where I show how the popular 1958 novel Exodus and the 1916 movie of the same name that starred Paul Newman really deeply, deeply ingrained in the minds of many Americans, especially older Americans, like the Biden, the Biden generation, right? Those older Americans, they were inculcated with a narrative that I call Nekba denialism that mm. fundamentally rests, that, ne that Nekba denialism fundamentally rests on anti-Arab racist tropes and Orientalist tropes. One trope holds that Palestinians have absolutely no religious or historical attachment to Palestine. Um, when you read the Exodus novel, which I, I don't necessarily recommend, uh, but I read it several times, that, you know, as part of my research. There's yeah. zero mention of the Dome of the Rock, zero mention of the Aqsa Mosque, zero mention of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You would have no idea that the quote-unquote Arabs living there, which is how they phrased it, had any sort of historical or religious or any kind of attachment to Palestine yeah. or Jerusalem. Another trope claims that they lacked a sense of national identity. They were just like random Bedouins and, and Salahi. And then the third is sort of divides the Arabs into good Arabs and bad Arabs. And so the good characters in that novel welcomed the Zionist settlers as bringing, as a part of a civilizing mission. They're going to help us improve our agriculture. They're bringing medicine and civilization. And then the bad Arabs were all those who opposed Zionist settlement. No political motivation was given, only that they were either hateful or barbaric or easily manipulated by their, uh, by their leaders. And so through the deployment of those racist tropes, the Exodus narrative popularized key elements of Nakba denialism in the West by blaming Palestinians for their own displacement, by saying that any form of resistance is illegitimate, and that ultimately Palestinians have no legitimate political claim to their land. Mm -hmm. so since the 1950s, the standard pro-Israel narrative has continued to use these racist and orientalist tropes to say that Palestinians have no legitimate ties to their land, no legitimate national claims, they have ruthless barbaric leaders, and therefore their calls to freedom can only be understood as inherently threatening to Jews. So it's a circular logic, but at its root, it's based deep, deep, deep Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism. So here's a question for you. Let's say mm -hmm. one of your students or a colleague or a neighbor of yours in Arizona mm -hmm. says to you, you know, Maha, I really respect you tremendously. Um, and I know how much this matters to you uh, biographically, uh, professionally, uh, emotionally, I, I know how much the issue of a free Palestine matters. I get it. Mm -hmm. And I want to understand. However, mm -hmm. when I hear people chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, mm -hmm. it triggers things in me. And it mm -hmm. makes me, it makes it sound genocidal. It mm -hmm. makes it sound like you're chanting that all the, um, all the Jews need to be driven into the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I respect you so much that I know that you're not a genocidal person, but mm -hmm. help, help me circle that square. Why right. is this phrase for this hypothetical person, this rhetorical person, mm -hmm. why is that phrase not a genocidal phrase? Great question. So a couple of things. I think one thing that I want to be clear about is that I don't think that all critics of this phrase or all people who say I'm triggered by this phrase are themselves bigots or Islamophobes or anything like that. 
um, I know that there isn't just the hypothetical person that you're referencing, but that there are a great deal of many real people, some of whom have actually said to me something very much along these lines. So I think the first thing that is important to stress is that while there is this legacy of anti-Arab racism and Islamophobia, that is, I think, uh, part of the context for why groups like the ADL and APAC try to get this uh, phrase banned and try to get it to be characterized as um, anti-Semitic or as genocidal or what have you. I think it's important to note that not every, not all critics or people who feel triggered by this phrase are themselves bigots. So that's the first thing that I would say is, is to make that clear. The second thing I would say is I get it. I get why you feel triggered by this phrase because you have been told for nearly 75 years now that Palestinians are violent and they hate Jews and they just want to push Jews into the ocean and they want to, you know, do all these terrible, horrible things. That's what your leaders have been telling you. That's what your organizations have been saying to you. That's what mainstream media has been depicting. That's what you read when you read Exodus or saw when you watched the movie. I get that that's the input that you and many others, frankly, have had for decades now. But rather than listening to what, how, what, to what critics of Palestinians say about what Palestinians want, I think a better approach would be to actually listen to what actual Palestinians say they want. And Palestinians, as I said to you earlier in our conversation, Palestinian leaders have for decades said, we don't want we don't want segregation, we don't want partition, but we do want a sharing of the land. And we do believe that all people, that there are multiple attachments to this land. And so there, I think, rather than seeing this as an endpoint to the conversation, I would take that person who said, you know, I feel triggered by this. I would see that as an invitation to start a conversation about what does a free Palestine from the river to the sea look like to people. And it's going to look different to different people. And not all Palestinians have a kumbaya vision of what from the river to the sea means. I think we need to be you know, clear and, and um, honest about that. But that also doesn't mean that all Palestinians who say this phrase are genocidal. I can't speak to what's in the heart of every single person who uses this phrase. And I'm also seeing many non-Palestinians take up this phrase to try to whitewash their own deplorable ideas. But if we look to the actual history of what Palestinians have said that they want to see as uh, what freedom looks like to them and what they want to see as an actual solution, then we'll see that there is a rich and well-documented history that shows that for Palestinians themselves, a free Palestine from the river to the sea does not necessarily preclude equal rights for Jews. It does not necessarily preclude individual rights or even collective rights. Now, there are different ways in which a free Palestine could be enacted. People have lots of different ideas. We've seen all kinds of proposals. And polls of Palestinians themselves show that they're not of one mind about this. And so... The first thing I would say, so to sort of sum up, what I would say is that let's look at what actual Palestinians have had to say about this, not just one group or another, not just a quote taken out of context and put on the memory website, but look at what actual Palestinians are saying themselves in their own terms, in their own ways. And then let's have a conversation of what freedom from the river to the sea looks like in ways that take into account all of the various conditions and expectations that people have. And so let's talk about what a political process would look like, one that is truly representative of all people, and see how that process unfolds. It would need to be a yeah. democratic process and an inclusive one, one that's based on shared principles, 
And I would hope that that shared principle could be freedom. I love it. Um, since I have you here for rhetorical questions, can I ask you, um, I'm going to read a, a statement, okay? And I'm curious if, again, this hypothetical friend read this statement to you and said, what do you think about this? I'm curious to see it how you would sort of like dismantle this idea. And let me give you context, okay? A, a friend sent this to me. This is a statement <laughs> um, from some director and CEO in Canada who is calling for the resignation of a pro-Palestinian employee at their um, institution, at this museum, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the statement, um, on the second page of the statement, um, it reads, Israel is a refugee state and not a colonizer. There was no, quote, mother country superpower or empire. Jews did not arrive in an armada with missionaries. Jews have never imposed the Hebrew language nor the religion on their neighbors in the Middle East. Uh, So-and-so needs some serious education on the Arab conquest of the 7th century to understand the religious hegemony of the region. This is not esoteric information. So... Uh, that's the end of the quote. Um, and the letter the letter keeps on going. You see mm -hmm. things like this all the time. I see things like this all the time, right? Um, and I always think that um, so often people live in their bubbles. They, they see the same things getting posted on Instagram. And I, I'm guilty of this. I don't spend enough mm -hmm. time listening to the talking points, not of, quote, the other side, but listening to the mm -hmm. talking points that people that are friends of mine are hearing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to give them like these, these quick answers of like, hey, when you see this, this is why this is not true. Right. You know, when you hear mm -hmm. this, this is a clear example of how to debunk these, these talking points. This is a very mm -hmm. succinct way of fact checking this stuff. So well, can I use you, since you're an expert on this topic, can yeah. I use you to sort of fact check and help somebody listening to that who doesn't get offended by it, says, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah actually, yeah. now that I come to think about it, it is a refugee well, state. It is not a colonizer. Now that I think about it, there is no mother country, right? Like when, well, they, when, they, say, when they hear that, what would be your easy response to help them understand like, no, that's actually not quite right. Right. So uh, I'm really glad you asked me this question because it also ties into my current book project. And so my Great. current book project is a uh, history of Palestine's people. So I'm going further back in time before nationalism and um, kind of thinking about this, thinking about the people of Palestine, not in terms of national formation, but before that, going back to the early Islamic and pre-Islamic period. And so I'm going to take it kind of chronologically since they mentioned the Arab conquests of the, of the 7th century. And so I think it's noted, it's, um, so first of all, there is no succinct answer because there's so many things to debunk in that short paragraph that it's, it's hard to do so very quickly, but I'll try. Okay. I'll try. So the first part has to do with the claim that the Arab conquests were themselves a form of settler colonialism. And that just doesn't adhere to what we know of as settler colonialism, nor does it, nor does it uh, jive with what we know of the actual history of the time. So when the Arabs conquered Palestine and, and those lands, the population there was overwhelmingly Christian. And it remained overwhelmingly Christian for hundreds of years afterwards. So the idea that they sort of came in and imposed and changed and settled and so forth just isn't true. That's number one. Number two, when the Arabs conquered Palestine and Jerusalem specifically, by that point, Jews had been expelled from Jerusalem for 500 years. They had been exiled from Jerusalem for 500 years after the Romans had kicked them out. Within a year or two of the Arabs conquering and taking control over Jerusalem, they allowed Jews to move back into Jerusalem for the first time in 500 years because they understood and recognized the religious attachment that Jews had to Jerusalem and as stewards of um, the land and the people and because they understood Christians and Jews to be Ahmed Kitab, 
the Muslim Arab conquerors actually guaranteed as part of their uh, truces, guaranteed religious freedom for the native inhabitants of that land. Yeah, for people who don't it's speak also Arabic, Arab, uh, Arab uh, Arab like people of the book, so to speak. Oh, sorry, yes, people of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is how Muslims understand Christians and Jews to be. Thank you for that. Uh, the other, or sort of another element of all of this is that the the Arabs who took control over Palestine, they integrated into the existing society. They didn't impose themselves. So the migration from the Arabian Peninsula to the Levant, to Bilad al-Shab or greater Syria, was actually not that many. What ends up happening, though, is they become integrated into the native populations, which is part of a much longer story in history of how people come into, settle into, and integrate into Palestine. So over centuries, Palestine does become majority Muslim and majority Arabic speaking, not because Arabs from the seventh century Arabia came and imposed themselves, but because of a natural evolution over time of, again, integration and um, conversion in some cases and uh, you know, all, all, all the different ways in which societies change and evolve over time. So that's the Arab part of it. To switch back to the Hebrew, uh, the Israeli part of it, and that they didn't impose Hebrew and they didn't do all of these different things, I think that there is a, there's an impetus to want to say, because critics of Israel are saying it's apartheid, we have to compare it directly to South Africa. And if it doesn't match exactly, then it's not apartheid. If we're going to say that Israel is a settler colonial state, we have to compare it exactly to the US or Canada or Australia. Well, the dynamics are different there, therefore it's not settler colonialism. If we're going to say it's racism, we have to look at Jim Crow or you know segregation or slavery in America. It's not exactly the same, therefore it doesn't apply. So historians like to say that history doesn't repeat itself, but rather it rhymes. And so what are the rhymes that we see in terms of subjugation, in terms of land theft, in terms of denying people connections to their land? What are the principles behind that subjugation, behind that unfreedom, the lack of freedom that Palestinians are facing? And we find then that there are elements of all of these things. There are elements of settler colonialism. I don't think it's correct to say that there is no motherland. I mean, American settlers, when they were coming, they were fleeing religious persecution in Great Britain, right? So the idea that you're fleeing from one country and seeking refuge from another doesn't preclude the idea that you would also simultaneously be annihilating the people who are already living there. Like one doesn't exclude the other or one doesn't yeah. negate the other. So Israel or Palestine before 1948 could be both a refuge for Jews seeking persecution from, sorry, Palestine could be both a refuge for Jews fleeing persecution, as well as a site in which settlers are eliminating Palestinians, whether by removing them from their land or claiming they don't have ties to it. So one doesn't negate the other. Uh, and understanding dynamics of repression and subjugation doesn't necessarily mean that it's a one-to-one -one with other contexts because there are other contexts. So yeah. to kind of sum it all up, I think what we need to do is look at, we need to take each case on its own terms and then look at the dynamics that are involved. And I'll give you one quick anecdote. Uh, that's not mine, actually, but the, um, I think it was, at, was it at Cooper Union on November 1st, the Palestine Literary Festival had a panel. I don't know if you saw it, but it had Rashid Khalidi and Michelle Alexander and ta Coates, who are all speaking about why we need to speak up now. And I think that Tana was at Coates talked at about Penn. No, this is different. It wasn't Palafest okay. at Penn. This was a Palestine Literary gathering. You can find it online, actually. Cool. It was in New York City yeah. on November, I think, 
And so Tana Hesse Coates talks about the first time he goes to Palestine. And yeah. he says, you know, we're stopped at a checkpoint and they checked our passports and then they gave them back to us. And then they just had to stand there. And I was like, I know what this looks like. This is familiar yeah. to me because he's familiar with the legacy of Jim Crow in, in this country. And he goes on to talk about his experiences and that sense of familiarity that he had. Native Americans, when they go to Palestine or when they even talk to Palestinians, and when likewise, when I talk to my native, like when I talk to a friend of mine here in Arizona from the Plano Alcum Nation, we talk about our experiences and those of our ancestors. We both have a deep, visceral sense of understanding where the other person is coming from. Yeah, they rhyme. So a kind of superficial one-to-one comparison, I think, is facile. I guess that would be my short answer. And we actually have to look at the deeper dynamics. And when we do, we find that we see a lot of parallels, even if they're not exact one-to-one manifestations. Yeah. The one thing, the one claim in here that I think is very, speaking of potency, is very potent um, in terms of (laughs) it as type of fake news is this idea of there was, quote, no mother country superpower or empire, you know? Um, And that people fall for that all the time. They say, oh yeah, that's right. I guess there is no superpower. Oh yeah, there is no mother country. In the simplest way possible, why is that not quite right? Because when the British colonized Palestine and when it was formalized as, as a mandate, in 1922, 19, 20, uh, the very first article at the very top of the British mandate for Palestine says that the British government, as part of its mandate, is going to undertake and facilitate the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The French mandate for Syria Lebanon And the British mandate for Iraq say that the British or the French are going to facilitate or going to undertake uh, actions that will basically help the natives take over control themselves at some point in time. I forget the exact language. But the British, from Article 1, from the very top, say, our role here is to facilitate the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. That's the Balfour language, the language of the Balfour Declaration. So from the very beginning of the British taking control over Palestine, they sought to do exactly that, facilitate the establishment of Israel in Pal- Jewish home, which became Israel, in Palestine. So that's the simplest answer. If you, if you or your listeners or readers want to know how they went about doing that, um, I think Rashid Khalidi's book, The Iron Cage, lays it out quite well. Um, there's another book called Colonizing Palestine by Arij Sabahuri, who I'd recommend you have on your show, by the way, because her book yeah, is fantastic. Um, she talks not so much about the British rule, but about the role that the Kibbutzim played in colonizing Palestine. And all the time they relied on the British for security to secure their their settlements in Palestine in the 1920s and 1940s. So the British played a key, key role um, in providing the space and the legal cover for the establishment of pre-state institutions, pre-state Zionist institutions, that then transformed into uh, the the, the Israeli state. The yeah. one thing I'll say about that is that a lot of people point to the last third of the British rule over Palestine. So the British ruled over Palestine from 1917 to the military conquest after World War I uh, to 1948 when they left. So a 31, let's say, 30-year period. And people look at the last nine years from the 1939 White Paper to the 1948 war and Israeli Declaration of Independence. In those last nine years, 
the Zionists were indeed at loggerheads with the British and you had attacks on British installations. You had, you know, Zionists violating the British limits on Jewish immigration into Palestine. And so people will take those last nine years and say, see, the British opposed the Israeli project or the Zionist project. But they ignore the first 20, 22 years in which the British very much facilitated and were very much a part of, and I would say were very much indispensable to the establishment of the state of Israel. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I like put this, uh, I asked this question on my, on my personal Instagram, asking people like, what things are they curious about and where they mm -hmm. have gaps of knowledge? And these are friends who are, who are, you know, grew up in the Arab world and are very familiar with the, the broader story. And a few people um, messaged me saying, I really have huge gaps in knowledge about the interwar periods. Mm -hmm. um, and how these like, you know, the, the Haganah operated and mm -hmm. where they got their funding from and where they got their metal, their weapons from and how how these pre uh, pre national institutions got built and and mm -hmm. you know all these kibbutzim. So um, if you have recommendations, you've mentioned um, two people already. But um, mm -hmm. if you have any other recommendations, I would love, 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 love uh, to speak to them and eventually have them on the series and do my do my homework. Sure. So I'd start with those two with Rashid Khalid. Both his book uh, The Iron Cage, as well as his most recent book. The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. Mm -hmm. And yep. then Abish's book is really fascinating. So both, Haradi's books, both of them are long, they cover a, a longer span of history. Mm -hmm. So they're more, they're good, like good books to start with. Abish's is more yep. of like a meat, um, it's a meaty monograph. Um, but what she does is goes into the local um, archives of the local kibbutzim in, in northern Palestine in the Galilee area, much of an Amr. And, um, goes through their own local archives. And, you know, she's a Palestinian citizen of Israel. She's fluent in Hebrew and Arabic. And so she's able to piece together a really fascinating story about how these uh, kibbutzniks, and these are the, like, the progressive ones. These are like the socialist mm -hmm. left sorts of like, you know, let's all get along kind. They're, the, they're also the kibbutzes that a lot of Americans and Europeans spent summers on in like the 50s and 60s, you know, you hear like Bernie Sanders and all these people, I spent a summer on a kibbutz. Yeah. It would be these kinds yeah. of kibbutz, very socialistic and so forth. Um, yeah. So read her book. She has a lot of really great stuff in there. And then cool. um, I have some more recommendations to give you as well. Okay. Um, Maha, this is amazing. Um, I'm so happy that we were able to have you on. Um, and that you are willing to do this during these very, very dark times. But um, I think people benefit tremendously from hearing you, from hearing the, these conversations. Uh, so thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And thanks for, thanks for focusing the spotlight on Palestine, especially during these uh, yeah. horrific times. Absolutely. So if anyone's listening to this and you haven't gone back and heard some of these other episodes, you can go check them out on YouTube. We have a whole playlist about it. Um, and if you're not following us on, uh, on social media, we upload tons of little clips. Um, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. So Maha, thanks so much. Thank you, Mikey.